Hi everyone, I'm Dr. David Fino. I am a surgical invasive cardiologist at HeartSouth Cardiovascular in Alabaster, Alabama. And today we're gonna to talk about a few things. We're gonna start off with May Thoner syndrome. So I'm sitting here in the vein clinic on the first floor of the 1022 building in Alabaster. For those of you who don't know, it's the only skyscraper in Alabaster, five stories. And so it's pretty easy to spot. It's like a beacon. <clears throat> and the first floor has now become Heart South Vein Clinic. And at the vein clinic, we see an awful lot of swelling. And one of the main things that can cause swelling is May Thurner syndrome. Now, it turns out this is one of those things that's uh, right in front of you, but nobody notices. It's a compression of the veins in the belly. So it's hard to image the veins in the belly with uh, any technique. We try to use ultrasound, we try to use CT and MRI. Really, you have to go in there with a catheter to see if those veins are getting compressed. When they are, the blood that's trying to go from the legs back up to the heart reaches some resistance. And with that resistance, there is fluid that develops in the legs and we see edema. The real tip off with May Thurner syndrome is if somebody has asymmetric findings. And what that means is one leg is more swollen than the other. I've seen a number of cases where somebody has a wound on one leg, but not the other. And that's actually a pretty common thing. And once we make sure it's not an arterial blockage, it's very likely to be related to May Thurner syndrome. May Thurner is something that we also treat here in the office uh, instead of in the first floor. We treat that up on the fifth floor. My colleagues, Dr. Segrest, Dr. Baumuri, and Dr. Meta can all do a venogram, can do an IVUS intravascular ultrasound, and can do a balloon venoplasty and a stent. And this is, in many instances, curative for May Thurner syndrome. You will find that over time, sometimes these stents need to be touched up or re-looked at. And you also find that where one side is affected, it's very possible, if not likely, that the other side will be affected. May Thurner is something that 20 years ago, I think a lot of people hadn't heard of. 10 years ago, we started to become aware of. Today, more and more vascular specialists are finding it prevalent in their entire population of patients. So if you have swelling of your legs, particularly if you have findings on one leg and not the other, or if every other cause of swelling has been ruled out, things like varicose veins, heart failure, protein deficiency, things like that, come to Heart South. We'd be happy to evaluate you for May Thurner syndrome. Also feel free to call us 205-663-5775 and set up an appointment in the Vascular Institute here in the 1022 building, first floor, Alabaster, Alabama. Thank you. That's awesome, Dr. Fino. So I have a couple questions for you regarding May Thurner syndrome. One of the questions I have is, if you said it sometimes has symptoms that are not so common. What are the symptoms that are very common, maybe not so common? When should someone come see you for it? Sure. So the question is, what are the common symptoms for May Thurner syndrome? And then what are the not so common symptoms? And it's exactly the right question to ask. I would say the most common thing that we see in patients who end up having May Thurner syndrome is just very simply swelling. Uh, particularly unexplained swelling, or what we call refractory edema. That's somebody who people have tried everything. They've tried compression hose. They've tried Lasix. They've tried losing weight. They've tried eating more protein. They've gotten the ultrasounds and they've ruled out a blood clot. These folks will very often have an element of external compression of their veins in the pelvic area, which is the definition of May Thurner syndrome. The not so common symptoms are what I alluded to a moment ago. So non-healing ulcers, um, I would say it's, it, it's not the most frequent presenting sign, but certainly in end stage disease, that's what you see. Other things that people see, um, unexplained neuropathy. So a pins and needles tingling of the legs, brawny brownish discoloration of the legs, um, failure of wounds to heal, particularly uh, patients who have had some kind of a procedure, like if you had a cyst removed from your leg and it never really healed, I've seen that before. And then I had one patient who actually had recurrent cellulitis. He had cellulitis over and over and his primary doctor, a very capable primary doctor up the street, would treat him with three or four courses of clindamycin every year and it would go away and three months later it would come back. 
So recurrent cellulitis that is unexplained is probably a circulatory issue. And if the arteries are okay, then they may have Maythoner syndrome. I'll give one more example that uh, happens to be in my mind because um, it was particularly surprising the way I found it. Um, we had a patient in vein clinic. They had classic Maythoner syndrome. I was sure we were gonna find that the pelvic veins were being compressed by an artery um, in the uh, legs. Well, it turned out this patient had an eight centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm. The abdominal aorta is supposed to be about two centimeters. They had a huge eight centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm. It was smashing the leg veins. Uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, Steve Taylor, our colleague in vas vascular surgery, was able to stent over that abdominal aortic aneurysm. And within a matter of days, the patient's uh, swelling went away, his external compression of his veins went away, and he did really well. I'll give you one more rare, very rare cause. This was a lady that I saw here at Shelby Baptist. Um, she was a heavier gal and she had a blood clot in her left leg. We found that she had Maythurner syndrome and not only did she have Maythurner, but uh, her vein was being occluded by a huge uh, 75 pound ovarian tumor that my colleague uh, up the street, Dr. Mac Barnes took out. Uh, I helped to get blood flow back to the veins and uh, my understanding was the lady did pretty well. So. What, what you find is that this thing where you get unusual swelling or asymmetric swelling, one side is larger than the other, there's always a reason it's a matter of chasing after it. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, another question I have is if we have a patient that comes in and they're coming in to get treatment for Maythoner syndrome, do they have to stay overnight anywhere? Do they have to be checked into the hospital? Tell us more about the recovery process for that. So the question is, if I have Maythoner syndrome and I want to get it taken care of uh, with stents, for example, in our vascular institute on the fifth floor with uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Balmuri, or if you come see me at the hospital, if we do it there, what's, what, what am I in for? What's going to happen? Right. So here at the vascular center, we do everything same day, uh, of course, unless there's a complication, in which case we'll get you over to Shelby Baptist Hospital. We come in in the morning. Uh, patients are seen by our anesthesia team, they're sedated, and then they have the procedure sometime that morning, usually between one and two hours of procedure time, not usually more than that. And then they're recovered, a little bit of pressure on the access site, and they go home that afternoon, same day. If we do it at the hospital, particularly if we clear out a blood clot called a DVT, a deep venous thrombosis, or if we find some things that are concerning, like perhaps if we are concerned about a perforation or if we're concerned that there's an underlying cancer, we'll keep you in the house, in the hospital for a day or so, so we can do some additional advanced imaging and make sure that we have you plugged in with the right subspecialty, uh, oncology, for example. So it's usually a one day admission. Now, one of the things you have to mention when you, ever you talk about procedural medicine, you have to talk about the possible complications. If someone has a complication, for example, if they have a perforation or if they have a problem during the procedure, like a blood clot, then unfortunately they probably can expect some additional surgeries and that may be a week or so in the hospital. The other thing we have to always keep in mind whenever we do procedures on people is even with the smallest procedure, there's always a chance of dying. And I tell people when the good Lord's ready for you, he comes and takes us. So although I, I have the utmost confidence in my team and I'm blessed that I have been given some procedural skills by our good Lord, there is always the possibility of something adverse happening. And that just has to be stated to everybody up front. And so we try to only operate if it's really absolutely necessary. I see, yeah, that's definitely a lot of great information. Now, let's say that I'm a patient, I come, I do the procedure, I'm done with the procedure, I go home, what can I expect to feel? What difference will this make for me? So the question is, day of the procedure and in the ensuing days, what am I gonna feel, Doc? How am I gonna do? So there's a couple things that happen. Because the belly and the pelvis is full of nerves and you have a stretching 
as you open this bad vein, and a lot of times this vein is scarred down, there is some abdominal pain. There's what we call retroperitoneal pain or um, pelvic floor pain that goes with this. And that can be pretty sharp, actually. And I will often give my patients a short course of pain medication, something like Ultram or even Vicodin, Percocet. And the concept is we'd rather we'd rather expect it and be able to deal with it than not have expected it and not have anything we can do to deal with it. The day you have the procedure, that is called post-op day zero. And usually the pain is worst on post-op day zero and the following day, post-op day one. By post-op day two, I ask my patients to go just on Tylenol and hopefully by day three or four, they're on nothing. Typically the access site or the place where we go in to put in the stent it just requires a Band-Aid, and you wanna be careful not to bear down, not to strain on the toilet, not to lift real heavy weights because you can burst back open that access site. So where that applies to a lot of people, females especially, is people who are carrying children. You have to figure out how big the kids are, and you have to try to tell them try to lift 20 pounds or less during that time. The other thing you gotta keep in mind, anytime you get a stent, whether it's in the heart or in the legs, you really have to think about whether or not you're able to take medications correctly. Those stents will not stay open if you do not take your meds correctly. So you have to usually be on aspirin. You usually have to be on a second blood thinner called Plavix. And very often we'll give people a course of a more aggressive blood thinner called Xarelto or Coumadin or Eliquis or one of these other medications. And the concept is we wanna do everything possible to avoid a blood clot in that time. Now, after a few hours after sedation, as a patient, you're welcome to walk around. If you have been sedated for the procedure, there is a risk of falling, so you, you really do wanna, you don't really wanna make big decisions, you don't wanna drive on that day. Other than that, the recovery is really not much. A lot of people go back to work post-op day one and really have minimal pain. And so if someone is having a lot of pain, they really need to report that to their doctor because there may have been a complication they need to be aware of. Okay, I see. So last question, what kind of patients do you see when you see a patient with May Turner? Are they, do they have a very active lifestyle? Are they sedentary? What's the age range? Kind of tell us more about the types of patients you see. So the question is about what kind of patients are, are at risk? What What is their demographic? What do they look like? And who out there can expect they might be at risk for May Thurner is I think really what you're asking. And the answer is it affects all age groups and all races of people. So there's no particular place that vein disease does not affect. I see it in people 20 to 30 years old, certainly as people get older. I see it a lot clustering in families. So. If mom had varicose veins, if mom had vein disease, very likely their children are likely to have uh, some form of vein disease. I have seen it in the pediatric population, most definitely. And it's just a matter of taking that time to really look at somebody's legs and see if one leg is more swollen than the other. Uh, as a population, I think as we get older, uh, let's just say 40 years old and older, about 25% of us statistically will have some degree of varicose veins. And in our last quartile of life, so from 75 to 100, virtually everybody has varicose veins. So if that gives you some idea. Then as far as the types of individuals, people who are on their feet a lot tend to have more vein disease than people who aren't. So school teachers, construction workers, people who have worked on the hard concrete, they can very often have swelling and it's not uncommon they would have May Thurner syndrome. Individuals that are obese, so have a body mass index of greater than 30, they're at higher risk for external compression by virtue of the mass in their abdominal region. Then anybody who's had radiation treatment to the abdomen or this whole pelvis area, for example, for certain cancers, that can increase the inflammation and in that sort of response. So we have to think about the possibility of external compression. The most common one that I think would be a telltale 
idea that we may want to screen them for May Therner as if they've been in some kind of motor vehicle accident and actually had pelvic trauma or something similar. Those folks unfortunately end up having a lot of subclinical vascular injuries and until you look for it, you don't know that they have it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fino. Um, what was the phone number to call in case that anybody wanted to come see you about this? It's my pleasure. Uh, please call 205-663-5775 and one of the friendly staff members at HeartSouth will be happy to help you and set up an appointment.